Hi, and welcome to the American Society of ECHO E3 Lecture Series. My name is Lucy Safi, and I am chair of the ASC Emerging ECHO Enthusiasts, also known as E3 Special Interest Group. This special interest group provides an opportunity for early career physicians, sonographers, and trainees who are interested in echocardiography to present, interact, and discuss echocardiographic topics. Each lecture is formatted as a 30-minute didactic lecture followed by a panel discussion. On the panel will be two moderators and an expert in the field. During the discussion section, the panelists will also answer audience questions, so please enter your questions in the comment box below. This virtual lecture series will be recorded and later available online via the ASC E3 website. Today's topic will be quantification of mitral regurgitation. My co-moderator is Dr. Jordan Strom. Dr. Strom is Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and a non-invasive cardiologist specializing in echo at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Dr. Strom was an inaugural fellow and the current faculty investigator at the Richard and Susan Smith Center for Outcomes Research in Cardiology. His research involves evaluation of the relationship of cardiac structure and function to health outcomes, particularly for valvular heart disease. Dr. Strom was also a member of the inaugural ASC Leadership Academy class and serves as a guest editor for the Journal of American Society of ECHO. Thank you for joining me today, Jordan. Thank you. Our guest expert today is Dr. Stephen Little. Dr. Little is the Program Director for Cardiovascular Disease Fellowship Program at Houston Methodist Hospital. He's Director of Structural Heart for the Houston Methodist System and Professor of Cardiology. He's also currently serving as the Vice President of the American Society of ECHO. His research activities have focused on the novel use of 3D ECHO for quantification of native and prosthetic valve dysfunction, as well as imaging guidance for percutaneous structural heart interventions. Welcome, Dr. Little, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Lucy. Pleasure to be here. Presenting our didactic lecture today will be Dr. Matthew Parker. Dr. Parker is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Massachusetts and Fellow of the American Society of ECHO. Dr. Parker is currently serving as Director of, ECHO, of the ECHO Lab at UMass Medical Center and is involved in the UMass Cardiology Fellowship Clinical Competency Committee. He was an invited lecturer at the ASC ECHO Florida, where he also led a 3D learning lab and workshop. Thank you, Dr. Parker, for joining us today and for your presentation. Thank you, Lucy, and, uh, and thank you to all the panelists and to all of you. I see we've got over 130 participants and counting. I think this is really exciting for the, for the E3 group uh, to kind of kick off, and hopefully this is the first of many. Um, while, that, uh, while that starts up, the, um, sort of the overall talk is to talk about uh, quantification of, of mitral regurgitation, something we're often asked to do. Uh, I have to say it's a little intimidating to be talking about this to uh, Dr. Little, who invented a lot of what we're going to be talking about. Um, but uh, hopefully I, I do it justice, and hopefully there's lots of good uh, conversation uh, near the end. So we're going to quickly review the causes and mechanisms of mitral regurgitation. You can't talk about the regurgitation without talking about the valve. But really this evening, I wanted to kind of geek out about how we measure uh, mitral regurgitation in the echo lab uh, in terms of what is the concept of severe versus non-severe and how we can measure it with PISA, with quantitative Doppler. And I think the wave of the future is really in being a contracted area as we move into 3D. And then how do we check our work with supportive signs of, of mitral regurgitation? And then um, I think some of the challenges we'll, we'll, uh, we'll actually get into more through, uh, more through discussion with you all. Um, so everybody has this slide or something close to it. Uh, the surgeons talk about mitral regurgitation caused by a valve that moves just fine but leaks anyway. That's things like perforations, clefts, uh, or pure annular dilatation. Um, a valve that moves too much, uh, like the flail of P2 that you see here, that's the most common thing we talk about when we talk about uh, type two or degenerative mitral regurgitation. Um, and then valves that don't move enough, either because of a valvulitis like rheumatic heart disease, uh, which causes restriction of the leaflets in both systole and diastole, or a valve that doesn't move because the ventricle doesn't move, 
Um, this is probably the most common cause of mitral regurgitation, at least in my lab, uh, the so-called type 3B. And then of course, there's also SAM with a uh, outflow tract obstruction, uh, pulling on the mitral valve in the wrong way. Uh, some people also talk about a type 5 mitral regurgitation when multiple things are wrong, and I think that's a little bit less helpful. Um, but all of this is really discussed in a lot of depth in the ACC AHA guideline for taking care of patients. We're not going to go too much into that tonight except to say that what the clinician, what the person taking care of the patient needs from us in the echo lab is some of this quantitative measurement, some of these numbers, uh, you know, and they actually need a lot of numbers from us. They want to know how big is the regurgitant orifice? How big is the hole in that valve? How much blood is flowing across it? How does that compare to the forward stroke volume? How big is the, the vena contract and the color flow jet? And they still put this angiographic grade in here, um, which I think is sort of outdated. And uh, you have my permission to make fun of anybody who talks about angiographic grade of MR in the 21st century. Everything we're talking about is already covered in the uh, ASC's recommendations for non-invasive evaluation of native valvular regurgitation. And uh, all of these pocket guidelines, the uh, reference books are worth having in your echo lab when you're scanning and when you're interpreting echoes. Also, if you pull out the pocket guideline, instead of using an app on your phone, it makes it you know, sort of clear that you're one of us and that you're not uh, uh, on Twitter um, doing something else. Um, if we just start by how do we see mitral regurgitation, of course, color flow Doppler is sort of the bread and butter here. Uh, but I'll, I'll point out that if your hospital is anything like my hospital, um, almost everybody in the place can take a picture like this. They've got a probe they can put it, uh, in the esophagus, in the ICUs, or in the ORs, or they've got a probe they can put on the chest, uh, in the ED, in the ICU, on the floors. And they can turn on color and they can say, wow, there's mitral regurgitation, what else do we need? I think we actually need a lot more than just looking at color, uh, and that's what we're here about tonight, but, um, but color is everywhere. And so it's gonna show up on our boards, what, what can color tell us and what can color not tell us. It can tell us where mitral regurgitation comes from. It gives us some important clues about uh, what's causing it, what's, whether it's caused by a, a prolapse, a flail, uh, SAM, things like that. Um, but the size of the color jet can, uh, can just kill us. It uh, gets bigger with a bigger regurgitant orifice area or with a bigger flow of mitral regurgitation, but it also gets bigger and smaller when you adjust the Nyquist limit, when you color, adjust the color gain on your machine. It gets bigger and smaller when you adjust the transducer frequency. And that can be as simple as changing from, you know, this is usually called the, uh, the resolution mode on, uh, on your TE probe. This is usually called the penetration mode on your TE probe. And that little knob makes your picture better. That's why you're turning it. But it also changes what your mitral regurgitation looks like. And that's not necessarily a problem if you know what, uh, what you're doing and how to compare one to the next. Um, but it can, really, uh, it can really just crucify us if we're not careful with it. And so what's more important than looking at the color and saying, yeah, there's some, oh boy, that's a lot of color, is what do we really mean when we say severe mitral regurgitation? And the concept is simple enough. We mean that as much blood is leaking backwards as is being pumped forward. Um, that's a regurgitant fraction of 50%. So that's internally normalized. We arbitrarily say that if 60 cc's leaks backwards, that's usually severe. But if you're, you know, I'm six feet tall, 200, 219 pounds these days after the COVID-19, I might not mind that much with 60 mLs of mitral regurgitation. But somebody who's, you know, 90 pounds dripping wet, their forward stroke volume might only be 50 mLs and 60 mLs of mitral regurgitation would be a disaster for them. So the regurgitant fraction internally normalizes to that. And as good as all that sounds, it's unfortunately really difficult to measure both how much is going forward and how much is leaking back, at least at any one place and one time in the heart. So what we end up relying on much more in the echo lab and spend most of our time uh, trying to measure in the echo lab is what is something we can measure that has a prognosis equal to severe MR, equal to a severe leak, or sort of you know, where the uh, rubber hits the road. Can we tell somebody, you know, you're in so much trouble because of this leak that you need to have a surgeon go in there and do something about it. So the natural history of the leak is worse than the risk of treatment. Which brings us to PISA, which does have that kind of outcomes data to it. And it also has a lot of problems with it. So we're gonna talk about that tonight, but I wanted to say 
that you, you hear echo people say to other echo people, are you a PISA person? I think I, can't, I heard that about 10 times when I took this job. Um, do you believe in PISA as if there's sort of an element of faith involved? And it's a measurement, it's been measured. We, so we need to get away from this kind of non-invasive on non-invasive violence because we've got outcomes data. This is a large study. Uh, this is a landmark trial getting a little long in the tooth these days. But they studied uh, 450 patients with organic or primary or type two MR, you know, prolapse and flail and, uh, and watched them. And you can see when they're stratified by the size of their PISA derived regurgitant orifice, you see that if your regurgitant orifice is less than 20 mLs, you do really just fine, at least for the first couple of years. If it's a little bit bigger in the 20 to 39 range, you start to get into trouble. And if your PISA ERO is more than 40, you're really gonna be in trouble uh, sooner or later. So there's two strengths to this. One is that we know if the, if you have sort of, if you have primary mitral regurgitation and your PISA ERO is large, that you're gonna get in trouble sooner or later. We also know, and this you really can't say of any of our other 2D or Doppler measures, we also know that if it's small, medium, or large, that you're in a little trouble, a lot of trouble, or really in bad trouble. Most things do a good job dis dif uh, differentiating between mild and severe. Really, this is one of the few things that can tell us a, a moderate range. So how do we do it? We've all seen this, and we're all sort of jealous that it never really looks like this most days in our lab. But what we're, what we're doing is we're adjusting the aliasing velocity of the mitral regurgitant jet in the direction of the MR so that we know the velocity of blood traveling at the blue-red interface on this little uh, hemispheric shell right here. And if we, know the if we know the diameter or size of that hemisphere, we know how much flow is crossing the blue-red interface. And we can then uh, divide that by the peak velocity to, si to find the size of the orifice. One of the reasons it doesn't look like the perfect, uh, perfect hemisphere in the textbook is that the Doppler angle along the sides actually sort of trims it in, makes it look more like a sea urchin. That's to be expected. And so what you wanna do is measure that radius right along the, the height of the urchin, if you will, not side to side. You can see it's just sort of all turned upside down and shift it the other way in, uh, in the TEE window. And then if you work through the peak velocity, the machine will give you, based on your radius, your aliasing velocity and your peak velocity, will give you the regurgitant orifice area of mitral regurgitation. And uh, when you've traced a VTI, the mitral regurgitant volume is thrown in for free. This looks wonderful. And so we can, uh, we can sort of put that one on our list and um, you know, how else might we do this? Quantitative Doppler, um, in theory, sort of gives you what you want. It lets you, t lets you know how much blood is coming in on a beat and how much blood is going out on a beat. The problem is you can't see that from just one window or even just from one beat. So you're actually constantly comparing um, multiple beats, multiple views, and you're making a bunch of geometric assumptions to try and put this together. The concept, again, is really just um, the mitral inflow or the total stroke volume minus the forward stroke volume must leave you with the, the regurgitant volume, what leaked out. And the regurgitant fraction can then be calculated from there. The biggest problem, in addition to all the multiple steps and a lot of us, you know, a lot of us are liberal arts types who don't want to really be calculating things, we want to be seeing things. Um, but the, the biggest problem is really the 3D uh, nature of the mitral annulus. You can't just measure its radius and figure out what its, uh, what its cross-sectional area is. So if you switch into 3D, you can do this. You see it's much more D-shaped. It's much more regular than that. It works reasonably well, but it's still based on multiple, multiple calculations. So as long as you're in 3D, and maybe some of the other panelists can talk about this. I've seen this in demos, but we don't have it in our lab. There is at least one uh, software vendor, uh, one of the ultrasound vendors, has a 3D color setup that gets rid of a lot of the um, geometric assumptions and just tells you how much is coming in across the mitral valve, how much is going out across the uh, aortic valve. Again, that's what we really want to know. The results that you get from this modality look a lot like uh, mitral uh, regurgitation in the MRI lab. 
Uh, it has all the same problems of color flow Doppler, Doppler angle, and aliasing that uh, anything else does, um, but it looks really beautiful. If we go back to color, um, one of the most reproducible things you can say about color is what is the vena contracta. So in 2D color, that means the width of the vena contracta. And so if you zoom up on a mitral regurgitant jet perpendicular to flow, which usually means a parasternal long axis or a parasternal short axis, uh, you can get a very nice um, picture of your color flow jet where you see the flow convergence at any aliasing velocity, it doesn't matter. The vena contracta, which is just downstream of the anatomic orifice and the jet sort of blossoming in the left atrium. You can measure that and you can be sure if that's small, you've just got mild mitral regurgitation. If it's large, you've got severe mitral regurgitation. But it's really just one dimensional. It's not accounting for the shape or eccentricity of a jet. There's no way for it to sort of handle the problem of multiple jets or timing of jets. It's just giving you the peak, uh, peak opening. Uh, but it, uh, like other things, once we go from 2D to 3D, we kind of get away from a lot of our limitations and get to see the truth uh, as it really is, as the philosophers would say. And so if you go into 3D, you can take uh, your, th your color jet, bisect it twice, and then move the third orthogonal plane up and down until you're at the vena contract and trace its area. You see here examples of nice, nearly round um, primary MR jets and smile-shaped uh, functional MR jets. I think this, uh, this paper from almost three years ago now uh, is the largest to date uh, validating how to, uh, how to apply this. And uh, I think it's a really exciting paper because it teaches us a couple of things. But if we first start with just what they did, they did, uh, as I said, they did 3D color acquisitions, bisected twice in multiplanar reformats to find the vena contracta and trace it. You can see how straightforward that is. It's just a one, after you've lined up your multiplanar reformat, it's just a single, a simple trace right around here. No argument, no PISA to explain to your interventional colleagues when they want to know what you're talking about. And then in terms of the, the reference standard, they really went uh, all in on 3D, which I think is wonderful in our current era, to uh, measure the volume of the left ventricle and the total stroke volume in 3D. Uh, no geometric assumptions, and then to compare the how much is going forward, they took the PW Doppler signal in the LVOT and compared it to the directly measured or planimetered uh, LVOT diameter. Um, so I think that uh, that in itself is a is a big step forward in in echo. But the the other thing that you see here is how well do we really do with PISA in 2D and Doppler. And we see that the sensitivities and specificities for, for PISA ERO are somewhere in the 80s, uh, a little bit better for degenerative MR, a little bit worse for functional MR, but 3D vena contracted trace like we've just been talking about has sensitivity and specificity um, approaching 95%, 94% uh, in all comers. Really exciting that we can know that really very well. Also with uh, excellent uh, intra-observer variability, because it's just one thing to trace. You just trace how big that is. Uh, you get to know very close to the truth and uh, very close to each other. The other thing we learned is that PISA, in that uh, Enrique Serrano paper that I showed you, was validated uh, in terms of its outcomes uh, for predicting you know, future surgery uh, in uh, the degenerative MR population. It doesn't work as well in the functional mitral regurgitation population. And there's been kind of a back and forth um, across the two sides of the, of the Atlantic, uh, back and forth through the guidelines, is a PISA calculated ERO of just 20 millimeters squared. Is that, when you calculate that in somebody with functional MR, is that in fact just as bad as when you calculate a PISA ERO of 40 in somebody with degenerative MR? And this, uh, I think this, uh, this study kind of shows that kind of, um, and I think that uh, this is a figure from uh, Dr. Little's uh, paper from Jack Imaging, uh, kind of uh, the first to lay out the concept of 3D vena contracta. Uh, I think this shows us why, because the PISA assumes a round opening. And so we can get very close to the truth with the PISA assumption 
in a uh, degenerative mitral valve that leaks. But more often than not, there's a, a smiley face shape with the, your functional mitral regurgitation. We can't get nearly as close with the, uh, uh, with the PISA assumption. You could just double it or have the, have the threshold to adjust for that. But why make any more assumptions when you can just trace and, and know? Uh, so I think that is a really exciting advance. But after we've done all this tracing, uh, how do we know that we're right? And also when we're talking about just 40 millimeters, if I trace 41 millimeters, Jordy traces 38, uh, Steve traces 45, and Lucy traces 35, how do we know who's right? Is it severe or not? And I think there's a number of clues to look for severe volume loading that we expect when we're diagnosing severe mitral regurgitation. The most helpful one, the one I probably put the most faith in, is the pulmonary vein flow. The pulmonary veins know what's going on. If you're pumping as much into them as you're pumping forward into the aorta, they're going to be the first to know. Uh, so just a quick reminder, the normal pulmonary vein flow has, often has two peaks, but should be systolic dominant. Systole, of course, uh, corresponds to mechanical systole, it corresponds to the T wave. So there's two peaks and then a smaller diastolic filling, and then there's a, often a reversal that follows the P wave. So this would be somebody with no MR uh, or only mild MR. And this is what severe MR looks like with this uh, hard to miss systolic flow reversal in pulmonary vein. Of course, sometimes you get something like this, where systole is blunted compared to diastole. Like a lot of other things, this could be anything. This could be mild, moderate, or severe depending on exactly which pulmonary vein, exactly how big the left atrium is, and a lot of other things. Other signals, uh, other signs of severe uh, volume loading. Um, a uh, CW Doppler signal of the mitral regurgitation that's approximately as dense as the inflow signal. Again, this is the same regurgitant fraction of 50% sort of concept at work. If there's as many red cells here as there are here, both of these signals will be equally dense. And a key thing that you get, usually you only see this in somebody crashing in the CCU, but this triangular Doppler signal means that you can almost see with your echo eye, the V wave that's building up in the left atrium to sort of push back as the ventricle empties into it. Pulmonary hypertension. Hopefully a lot of your patients aren't walking in with pulmonary hypertension from their severe MR, but when it's present, it confirms that the, uh, the MR has triggered maladaptory mechanisms in the pulmonary vasculature. This one I think is, it's always there. It's, you get it for free, so you should always look at it and incorporate it into your grading. An E-dominant mitral inflow, uh, which should mean an E-velocity greater than 120 milliseconds, um, or you know, even better like this when it's uh, an obvious restrictive pattern. Severe mitral regurgitation is a severe volume load lesion. So the left atrium should be pushing more blood into the ventricle than it's ready to accommodate. So you should get an, a, a rapid, uh, a high E velocity with a rapid deceleration time. You really can't have severe MR with a mitral inflow that looks like this on the, on the left. And then left ventricular and left atrial dilation. I think some people have actually programmed their reporting software to uh, remind you, if you're about to say there's severe MR, the left atrial volume better be over 34 because the, it, it has to be. There has to be an, enough space in the heart uh, to accommodate the regurgitant volume, the forward volume, and whatever's left at the end of systole. Related to that, you should be able to generate a very high ejection fraction since you're moving all of this blood out of the ventricle during systole. So this is the uh, sort of time-honored 60-40 rule for mitral regurgitation. If your ventricle is doing its job and it's leaking like crazy, there should be an ejection fraction more than 60% and a left ventricular in systolic diameter less than 40 millimeters or four centimeters. Those numbers actually come from the M-mode era, from the late eight patients scanned in the late 80s, studied in the early 90s. When this, uh, when this was updated uh, for the 2D era, it turns out that you should actually be a little better than that because we can measure it a little more accurately. Your ejection fraction should be 64% and your left ventricular in, uh, systolic diameter should be less than 37. Otherwise you're going to, that sort of means that you've got some subclinical LV dysfunction and you've got a higher chance of heart failure after surgery. 
So some of you, I'm sure, are working on updating this already for the 3D era. Uh, we'll be uh, excited to see what you find. Uh, but 6040 is still easier to remember than 6437. So I still teach the fellows that way. But so to summarize that, uh, severe mitral regurgitation by the rules is the 4567 rule of an EROA by PISA or by 3D vena contracta greater than 40 millimeters squared, a regurgitant fraction greater than 50%, or a regurgitant volume greater than 60, and a 2D vena contracta width greater than 7, all means severe MR. And to prove that, to sort of know that you're right, you want to see evidence of volume loading throughout your echo. And then remember, if the ejection fraction is less than 60 or the systolic diameter is greater than 40, you've got to raise a red flag that somebody's hurting from their mitral regurgitation. So sometimes we just can't know it all. We can't, can't see it all. And uh, if we're being honest, None of our patients read the textbook, so almost none of them have all of those things that line up. So sometimes you need more data. If, uh, if you can't see the valve well, or if you've got poor quality Doppler signals, transesophageal echo. Also, at least in my lab, a lot of our transthoracic equipment is older. It's 2D only. Our TE equipment is 3D, and we get the beautiful 3D that I was showing you when we switched to transesophageal, so that's often helpful. Sometimes your left ventricular volumes, no matter what you do, they just don't add up with your MR volume. You just can't explain where all that blood came from if it's leaking out. Cardiac MRI is really the gold standard for volumes and is often helpful. And uh, too many things go wrong at once. Sometimes you've got more than just isolated MR and you need a left and right heart cath to put it all together. And along those lines, especially when you're taking care of an asymptomatic patient, you think they've got severe MR, uh, you know, the carpenters say, cut tw uh, sorry, measure twice and cut once. A lot of patients with severe MR are going to get all of these tests anyway. And so combining them all to be certain is more helpful than sort of uh, arguing about which is, which is the right one. Uh, yes and both is usually the answer. So I think that covers us for, um, for how to measure mitral regurgitation. And uh, I think at this point, uh, Lucy would be, if it's all right with you, we'll open up for discussion. Excellent, excellent lecture. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, we did get a couple of questions in the question and answer box at the bottom. And I encourage you, if you have any further questions to go ahead and use that box. Um, but I wanted to open up uh, the questions and ask Dr. Little the first question. Um, Dr. Little, what advice can you give for quantification measurements for eccentric MR jets? Thanks, Lucy. And uh, <clears throat> so thanks to Matt. That was a great slide and a great series of slides and, and right on time. Amazing. You uh, <laughs> exactly what you predicted. Um, so I'll just comment a little bit. I mean, I, I work and uh, sort of grew up in a very quantitative lab, uh, Bill Zogby's lab, Insurance Naga's lab in Houston. Uh, and we've been doing this a long time. Um, but I think that the sort of the early message would be be patient and don't jump to the quantitation. Um, you know, the approach to mitral regurgitation that, that works is the first question. And I think the first series of slides that Matt showed was mechanism. You have to stop and ask, what is the mechanism first? Um, and the Carpentier slide, uh, the classification, it is important to be familiar with that. I must say personally, I'm not a huge fan of it. And we don't generally put that terminology in our reports uh, because I've got that slide and Matt's got that slide and probably all the panelists have that slide, but you always have to show the image of what is the Carpentier classification. One, two, three, three A, three B, maybe four, maybe five. Um, a classification is useful if you don't have to keep showing a graphic every time. Um, so, but I think the, the concept of understand the mechanism and report the mechanism. My pet peeve is to see an echo report that says structurally normal valve, severe MR. Um, so somebody just hasn't stopped and, and linked those things together. So mechanism comes first. Before you jump even then to quantification is think about the timing, right? So you're going to look. If this is, you know, allied to mechanism, if it's a bar lows with a late systolic event and you've got this huge PISA or this huge vena contracta, but it only occurs in the latter half of the cardiac cycle or the latter half of systole, that should influence what tools you're going to use for the quantitation. So don't just quantify. Um, think about mechanism, the timing of the lesion that you can see, 
then you choose your tool based on that data you've already gathered. I think that that would be my approach. So to your question, Lucy, about an eccentric jet. Okay, so I'm wondering why. Why why is it eccentric? Is it asymmetric tethering uh, of the valve due to subvalvular apparatus and a focal infarct? Is it is it uh, a flail leaflet? Um, so you know, I'm answering those questions first. Um, is it an eccentric jet throughout the entire systolic phase or just at the end because you took a while to develop your prolapse? So these things matter. Um, for those ones, you know, yes, you can do a PISA and you can do an angle correction. Do we do that very often? No. Um, it makes sense um, from the hydrodynamic principle, but it's actually kind of tough to do. Uh, vena contraction can be very helpful, you know, to dichotomize mild from severe in an eccentric jet. Um, but in general, the approach is one of, you're a detective, right? You, and, and you're looking at this with a hypothesis. You start the case. Okay, this looks mild. Let me find more data to support that this is mild. Or this looks pretty severe. Let me find some more data. And that's where you pull in your, you know, your E-wave, your pulmonary vein flow, your, you have to add all of those layers of data. Um, and then the more things that, you know, get you towards a smoking gun or a confession or video evidence that this is the crime, the, the happier you are to convict, you know, but you really have to, to do it that way. And that's what the ASE guidelines say to do. It's a summative approach where you bring all of this data to bear. And in the end, you're making yourself more confident in your decision or you're going to the other extreme. Um, and that, that would be my approach. Yeah, you absolutely have to comment on mechanism first, because like you said, it really will drive the investigation and in, in which order you do things, especially when you're doing a TE under a limited anesthesia time. I think you got to you know, go for the put, you know, go for the big money pay making pictures, right? So go for your pulmonary veins, go for your quantification. And you commented a little bit on um, angle correction for PISA, um, you know, clinically, how often is that done? Um, does anyone correct on a day-to-day -day basis in their labs? And is that something that, you know, we should be focusing on? Just opening it up to everyone. Yeah, I'll take this here. So, you know, I, I do think that, first of all, I wanted to say that's a marvelous presentation, uh, Matt, and, and, and a great comment by, by, by Steve and, and others. And I, I really do think that an integrative approach uh, is, is very important. And, and it's also the guideline-based approach, using all the parameters that you have available, as well as maybe some clinical history. You wanna know the chronicity of the underlying illness to see. You may not have, for example, left atrial dilation or, or pulmonary hypertension if this is an, 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 uh, an acute MR. So um, using all the, the, the information at, at your disposal to be able to answer this. Now that said, um, where it can fall apart is circumstances like eccentric jets, for example, with ankle correction, Ankle correction is an accommodation, it's not perfect. And so you're making assumptions uh, that may be violated um, by the eccentric nature of the underlying jet. Uh, I find in circumstances like these, and I don't know if, uh, what the other panelists think, but I, I actually do feel like MR, uh, that is MRI can be quite helpful when you have eccentric jets, uh, it, depending on how eccentric the, the jet is to be able to assess the severity of it. The two are measuring very different things, one being the MR measuring the uh, degree of mitral regurgitation throughout the cardiac cycle, whereas the PISA is really measuring the, the acute or most severe portion of, 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 of the jet. Uh, but, but that said, I, I think there are limitations to the PISA method when you have a very highly eccentric jet and you want to be able to use the other methods at your disposal to be able to grade the severity of MR. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, can I just add to that? Um, I don't use an angle correction per se, but when I, I'll calculate the PISA, assuming that it's sort of real, and then I'll look at it and I'll say, you know, this is a constrained little you know, wedge of a PISA instead of a whole hemisphere, and this is really eccentric, so my Doppler, my Doppler velocity is probably going to be off. And so then I'll sort of use it in my mind to know whether I'm going to say that PISA is underestimating here or PISA is overestimating here. Uh, I don't correct the number itself, but I kind of decide whether I think this is lying high or lying on the low side. Do you still report it? I'll report it and then I'll say it's under or overestimated for whatever reasons I have in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
going uh, back to the paper, Matt, that you uh, referenced, um, I believe Dr. Little, you were one of the authors on it. One of the questions from the audience was um, when you're doing a 3D um, EROA measurement, direct planimetry, how do you account for blooming artifact? So I'll, I'll take that. We've done quite a bit of work with vena contracta area, um, in vitro stuff, clinical stuff, post microclip stuff. Um, the short answer is it, it can be a challenge and you have to get comfortable with it. Like all echo techniques, if, if the only time you ever try to do it is to make a, an important clinical decision, then you're out of practice. Uh, and you really have to get comfortable with, you know, understanding the nominal gain settings on your machine. Yes, gain can, can bloom it up or down. Um, you know, you want it to be zoomed, you want to have good co quality color. Um, the vendors are all getting better at this, right? The color Doppler that we get to enjoy today is not the stuff of 10 years ago. Now, not only is it single beat and higher, and higher uh, frequency, um, it's just the right priority algorithm, which is when the software is told, here's a piece of tissue that could be tissue or it could be flow, which one is it? It has to make a choice, that's an algorithm. Um, those sort of things have been written into the machines now and they're better than they were. So it is better. If I looked at a vena contracta area today versus even five years ago, they're very different, but they do take some practice. Uh, and you have to sort of practice like all echo techniques. You have to say, I know what this is from other, um, other tools, from other modalities sometimes, but I'm going to try this vena contracta and see if I get this to be moderate because these other things said it was moderate. And when you put in that time and effort, you get better at it and you start to understand you know, it's just like CT. When you're measuring calcium on a CT, do you trim the calcium? Do you trim the blooming? Do you include the blooming? These are the sorts of things that come with practice. Uh, it's hard to describe. You have to kind of do it. Um, but in all things echo, don't just do the thing the one time it, you need to make a decision. You have to practice these these techniques. And, and vena contracta is just one of them. Practice and, and makes would, perfect. Yep. I agree. And I, I would add to that, that, that the real... Uh, sweet spot for 3D vena contracta area um, is where you, where the geometry of the orifice is is uh, abnormal. So you know the Pisa assumption that it's a semicircular uh, orifice it really falls apart as you mentioned also with 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 functional MR, but but also in circumstances where you have multiple jets as well. So um, this is uh, and or a sort of distortion of the geometry of the orifice where it can be really abnormal. And 3D vena contracta area, I think potentially has a, has a role in those circumstances, um, a developing role in those areas uh, to sort of understand what the severity of the MR is. Yeah, I mean, I, I just also had the comment that, you know, I think the term that's often used is, you know, color flow Doppler. Uh, which it shouldn't be, right? There's, you're not measuring flow. Um, it's a parametric display of velocities. And I think when we force ourselves to use that term and to remember that, that we're not seeing flow. Um, and that way, you know, this thing that you're seeing is subject to entrainment, to gain, to Nyquist limit, to all of the things that Matt showed. And you just have to remember that, you know, that great slide you have, uh, you know, determinants of color Doppler jet area. There's seven or eight things and the valve hole is only one of them. Um, so you have to be thinking about that. So I think it's important to recognize that it's a, it's a velocity map that you're interpreting, uh, not flow. Another question from the audience, they're asking, is PISA um, more accurate in one view as opposed to others? So is there any particular view that you like to do PISA in? Sorry, Lucy, who's that question for? Whoever wants to answer it. <laughs> go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, go ahead, Jordan. So, so yeah, so this gets, a, I guess, a little bit to sort of my broader approach to MR. And, and I think, you know, building on some of the, the, the work that Enriquez uh, Garcia Sion has, has um, put forth in sort of an older uh, ASE webinar, uh, I, I, do, I do think that there's a real role for sort of finding the maximal uh, and largest, that is the dominant MR jet. And, and you can do this using the traditional 2D definitions, for example, on TEE and saying this scallop is this scallop, but oftentimes you're wrong. Um, so there's the, the benefit of, of 3D, but there's also the benefit of multiplane. And, and I do find, for example, um, one approach that works pretty well is to look at 
the uh, 60 degree uh, mid commissural view, you, you get uh, so A3, P3 on one side, A2, uh, A1, P1 on the other side, and A2, P2 in the center. And, and so what that allows you to do is if you draw a 90 degree plane to that, you can actually assess the, uh, the, the degree of the jet at A1, P1, A2, P2, and A3, P3. And I think in so doing allows you to, to identify what is the, what's the largest piece of jet. I, ideally, you want to be able to use the, the largest jet that you see in, in mid-systole. Don't know if that answers your question. No, great, great answer. A um, lot of questions. And I urge you, if you have any particular question, to go ahead and input it through the Q&A um, Q box at the bottom. So um, another question regarding uh, when there's multiple jets. Um, people would like to know when you're grading uh, severe MR or the, the degree of mitral regurgitation, um, when can, when do you add the jets? Um, and, you know, again, this can be answered by any, any of the panelists. I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, you know, that, that's a great question and it's challenging. The, the first question would be to me, do you really have multiple jets? Because oftentimes it's uh, some version of secondary MR where you've got a crescent shaped defect. And if you're just using the two chamber view and you're seeing two different spots of the crescent, it'll look like two jets when in fact it's, if you looked at an on fast 3D, it would be one big jet. So first thing is, you know, make sure it comes back to the first statement is your, what's your mechanism? Multiple jets on FMR is probably unlikely. Uh, mixed disease, sure, possible with primary, but unlikely with an FMR case. Um, when you have multiple jets, the concepts of yes, in theory, you could add vena contract area together. We, we've done some work in that. In theory, you could add truly independent pieces together. But really, you just have to start looking at your ancillary data, right? Look at the pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins don't care if it's five jets or one. Um, the LVOT stroke volume doesn't care how many MR jets you have. So look at the consequences of this event. Um, if the pulmonary veins are unhappy with S wave reversed or really truly blunted in sinus rhythm, that patient's going to be unhappy. And that is probably hemodynamically significant MR. Um, you know, that's, uh, I saw a question there from, from Serge from Cleveland Clinic uh, about uh, quantitation of MR after clip. And, and one thing we've learned in the recent era is to really respect the pulmonary veins more so than we ever did before. We spent a lot of time getting good pulmonary vein before, and good pulmonary vein after. And if the pulmonary veins are happy, you could usually argue that you're finished. It doesn't matter what the color looks like. Absolutely. And I would add to that, pul pulmonary veins, plural. You really do need to interrogate uh, all of them. If you, can, if you can see them, that's great because you may have reversal in one, but not have reversal in another. And so it really is, there's not one pulmonary vein per se that is, uh, is going to be better. It depends on the direction of the jet and, and, and also the hemodynamic consequences. So. And um, I know that there's a couple panelists that are involved in training programs. And here's a question in terms of in a, in a training program with varying levels of competence in a busy echo program with increasing volumes and more quantification, how do you ensure reproducibility and quality? <laughs> Boy, that's a, that's a tough one. I mean, that's, that's a challenge probably of every training program and in every lab director is you know, reproducibility, never mind the training, just of the different staff that are in the lab. You know, does everybody apply the same technique in the same case? Um, everybody has their favorites, um, you know, things that are easy, things that are hard. Um, you know, our approach to um, quality is frequent reviews, right? We, we sit as in a lab and we look at reads and we do, you know, spot checks and audits and we throw it up there. Uh, we blind who the reader was and we all look at it. And if there's a large discrepancy between the collective and the individual, they get a letter saying, explain yourself. Uh, we also have recently uh, in the last couple of years taken on a, a, a systematic comparison with other modalities. We look at MRI, we look at echo. We think, all right, well, is there a discrepancy? If so, why? And we explain the discrepancy. It's not always that echo is wrong and MRI is right. Um, it's quite interesting how that there is some variation. So, it's, it, I would say quality is not accidental. Uh, it really takes a, a lot of effort. And we, our specific answer to the training question is we just try to incorporate the fellows into all of that training. So they see how we do it. Um, and they're as subject to the errors that we are. Yeah, Dr. Parker, I know that you're involved in, in, in this as well. Um, what do you do at your lab? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I we've got all the same challenges everybody else does. And uh, I think um, talking about, you know, people tend to get very comfortable with one way. And I, I think you get stronger by trying it multiple ways. Uh, in other words, you know, looking at um, your vena contracta is also looking at your PISA, practicing it each time that there's enough signal to measure, um, but also trying it the ways you're not so comfortable so that you can cross compare with yourself um, in addition to cross comparing with modalities. I mean, I think that is very important, but um, within ECHO, you know, I used to think when I was a trainee, I'm just gonna pick the best of these, you know, four different ways to quantify MR and then I'm just gonna do that one. And patients don't always have good windows for the one you wanna do. And the one you wanna do um, may not sort of fit with all of your supportive data. So trying all of them and then internally uh, quality checking yourself, I think is the only way to get through an echo. I think you hit something, Matt. I mean, when I read abstracts or manuscripts and you review them, and it's a place X looked at 100 patients with significant MR and they applied PISA to everybody. I always shudder because I think you took one pool and applied it to everybody. Uh, and sometimes worse, they don't even say if it's primary or secondary MR. They just used one tool. Um, right away, you know that there's a problem um, and that, you know, that that's not. On the other hand, it's a little throwaway to say, you know, we follow the AAC criteria. <laughs> well, how did you follow the AAC criteria? Did yeah. you, you know, you, you looked at everything all the time or what did you do? So it is, I get it, it's a bit nebulous to do that, but MR quantitation requires a toolbox and, and you got to get comfortable with every tool in the box. From a training perspective, one of the other things I have to pick up on is, you know, you got to practice stuff, right? So a, a fellow will, for the first time, look at an MR case and say, well, I'm trying to measure this, the inflow at the annulus. And I'm going to measure the inflow in the LVOT. I said, well, how many times have you measured the inflow in the annulus? Well, this time, when else? Well, maybe one other time. Um, so that you, you know, you pair with a sonographer and you practice, you know, when you know there's no MR, then you practice Doppler stroke at volume in equals Doppler stroke volume out, and you have an internal control. If the only time you ever try to do something is in the setting of severe MR or possibly severe MR, uh, you're unlikely to be successful. Yeah. yeah I, I I would just echo everything that everybody said. I, we, we have the same issues as, as a whole. And, and I think that, uh, you know, we haven't done this yet, so I'll let you know how it goes. But we're, we're piloting a program right now to actually do a similar uh, type of workshop as um, Matt has done um, uh, through AAC um, in person in our lab. So everybody sits around a table. We all uh, stare at the same Echo Pack screen. And, and each person has a chance to be able to, to do their PISA measurements. And we get a sense of what, where are the areas that are sort of variable amongst our readers and, and also amongst our, our, our staff and in, in acquiring the images in the first place. And um, trying to standardize measurements across a lab is, is, is extremely, uh, extremely challenging. Um, and and uh, one case or two cases is, is not enough. Uh, I do think that there's a certain learning curve that comes with doing this over and over again. But, but again, also a, a certain flexibility that comes with doing this over and over again and recognizing where, yeah, I did this right and it doesn't seem to qu quite fit with the rest of the data that I have. And then sort of resting back on, on the other supportive signs that you have to suggest this is, this, is, uh, this is severe or not. And that goes along the lines of what Dr. Parker said earlier, where you see an eccentric jet that you know is severe, but the PISA that you may get is not in the severe range. And then you can put a qualifier, you know, likely underestimated due to the eccentricity of the jet. Um, and, you know, again, everything else may fit. The pulmonary veins may be reversed. You know, you may have all the other supportive criteria, um, but, you know, you may not be able to just angle um, the CW cursor that the way you need it to be or get a, an appropriate radius. So a um, couple more questions coming in. And again, I, I encourage you to write any questions that you may have in the, uh, in the question and answer box. But there's a couple more questions that have come in about AI and in terms of um, like the mitral valve navigator um, and any kind of AI technology. Are, is anyone in your lab um, using AI to measure mitral regurgitation at this point, or is that still pretty much under uh, clinical investigation? Anyone can, can answer. Our lab was all HI, which is human intelligence. <laughs> uh, 
for now. We're, we're not really uh, incorporating AI uh, yet. We, we hope to one day, days will get easier, but no real experience with that so far. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, and I think, you know, where AI really has a strong suit potentially in the space is, is getting us more standard with, with reporting volumes. Um, you know, I think one of the, the striking things of Matt's uh, presentation is the 4060 rule. You know, we're still using 40, uh, at, we're still using dimensions in, in our surgical decision making. And, and yet we have uh, data using volumes and we've moved away as a society, as a field towards using uh, volumes and, and even indexing for PSA, of course, which the, the, that other measure does not. And so, you know, how do we move away from that? Well, measuring volumes is challenging. It's hard. It takes time. Uh, it takes time to do right. Uh, one of the ways that AI could really assist in that would be to automatically calculate LV volumes. And if we get to a point where the AI algorithm is uh, good enough, um, then it may be actually less error prone than, than the human measurement. But, but again, it, we're not there. Um, and, and so human intelligence it is for now. Um, but, but I do think sort of getting good at, at, at measuring volumes, uh, I think will, will help as well going forward in the future. There, there's also a couple of questions about, um, and I know Dr. Little already touched on this a little bit, but how to quantify MR after edge-to-edge -edge repair. There will be uh, another lecture later this year that focused specifically on the mitral clip procedure. Um, so I encourage you to keep a lookout for that uh, lecture. But um, if anyone wants to just briefly touch base on what they do um, in terms of quantification of MR after edge-to-edge -edge repair, um, I know, Dr. Little, you said assessing the mitral, uh, the pulmonary veins, but is there anything else in particular you would recommend? I mean, you hope to see a, an increase in forward stroke volume. Um, you know, so our practice is to get typically a deep transgastric, and you know, we spend a little time, get a nice angulation to get an LVOT stroke volume. Uh, and you hope to see that go up considerably when you're finished. I mean, that doesn't always tell you you're done, but it's a helpful finding. The pulmonary veins are important, and, and I agree, veins, plural, you get as many as you can visualize. It's, it's the, they don't always agree with each other. So uh, you sort of find the worst one. If you've made the worst one substantially better, you're usually in good shape. Um, the color Doppler applications that we've talked about can be very challenging. Uh, you know, you, yes, in theory, you can sum different PISAs uh, depending where your clips are. If you have more than one clip, multiple clips, multiple residual defects. Um, some of that also takes, you know, it doesn't really acknowledge the practicality of these procedures though. Generally, you're gonna clip until you run out of diastolic gradient. Um, you're often not gonna say, well, I've, you know, here's a big color jet and I don't necessarily know if it's moderate or severe and we're gonna apply one quantitative tool to figure this out. Often it's, you know, the, the interventionalist will say, hey, there's color there, I don't like that. Let's, let's put another clip if we can, um, but, you know, our job is often to say, we're not treating the color, we're treating the patient. And if the veins are, if you've got an upright S wave uh, and you've got one clip on and things are looking good, our job is often to say, no, no, this, we're done. We're, <laughs> this patient's gonna do fine. So it's a very imperfect science. Uh, it takes all the elements of MR quantitation that we've just discussed and makes them more difficult uh, when you put some metallic stuff on the leaflet, um, but it's, it's manageable and somehow patients seem to do very well. And then uh, there's a couple of questions more about quantification of MR with other organ systems. Um, can other organ systems such as liver and kidney dysfunction indicate MR severity? Hmm. It's an interesting idea. Um, there, there are certainly a, a number of factors at play there, which is the closeness of relationship between the TR severity and MR severity, because the liver ultimately and liver congestion and, and renal congestion um, is ultimately greatly affected by RV function as well as TR severity. Um, independently in of itself, I don't know um, that, that this has been evaluated, but, um, but, but I do think that there are certainly the, the effects in the liver seeing, seeing, for example, if you see to be severe TR and severe pulmonary hypertension and severe RV dilation in somebody who previously or had normal at a normal RV except for severe MR. I think I think that indicates to you that the MR is likely severe, but I don't know that the the, the liver in and of itself can be uh, a way of, of of determining that. 
it seems like it's an opportunity for further research, uh, for sure. Um, so that, Lucy, I just wanted to say that the, the recognition of, you know, other organ dysfunction, I, I completely agree with, with Jordan's comments. You can't necessarily use that to help you understand the severity of the valve lesion, um, but the prognosis of the valve lesion is definitely influenced by other organ systems. So, you know, this gets into the discussion around when you're saying mild, moderate, and severe, and this is the confusion across the pond uh, and the confusion between the 2014 and the 2017 AHA ACC valve guidelines, where we had this little brief window uh, where we did not reconcile FMR quantitation. And then we decided we're all going to be friendly again and we're going to re reconcile and, and come back with the same numbers, which is, you know, EOA of 0.4 and 60 and 50% uh, reversion and fraction. Um, and I think the job of the ECHO echo reader is to be quantifying by and large volumes and, and valve areas um, and not necessarily make that leap of in this particular patient, this has this prognostic value. Um, and the guidelines you know, expressly talk about that. Um, if your EF is 20%, then a you know, EOA of 0.2 may be prognostically very important, um, but quantitatively that may still be moderate MR. Now, and then you factor in the reversion fraction, which is really the index for that patient, or at least for that ventricle and that flow condition. Um, but I think that's an important point to make is, you know, generally now we all recognize we're quantifying volumes and areas, not, and often that is enough and has a very clear association with prognosis. But in some patients, the prognosis of a moderate lesion is poor. Absolutely. Totally agree. And, and, I, and I think this also gets to the idea idea raised by uh, Paul Graber and colleagues, which is that of proportionate versus disproportionate MR. Many of the measurements that we're talking about regarding to volume EROA are, are ultimately uh, volumetric measurements. And so when you have a larger LD, you would expect a larger uh, regurgitative volume. But um, the question is ultimately, uh, he, Paul Graber used this uh, example of proportionate versus disproportionate in MR to explain some of the differences between the COAP study, which study, uh, which was suggested uh, in benefit to edge to edge repair versus the mitral FR study, which didn't. And potentially there may be sort of disproportionate uh, MR enlargement, um, uh, disproportionate MR. Um, but, but what do we actually use as a, a specific cutoff to be able to say something is disproportionate or not and its relationship with outcomes, I think still is, is um, uh, remains to be fully sorted out. That's a very excellent point. And um, you know, we're, we're getting to the end of our hour and I just wanted to thank all of you for participating, um, the, both all the panelists, Dr. Little, our expert, uh, Dr. Strong, Dr. Parker for an excellent presentation. Um, I wanted to also thank everyone for logging in from home and for the excellent questions that you placed in, in the question and answer box. I encourage you to continue to um, participate to other lectures in our series, and thank you for joining us today in our inaugural uh, E3 lecture. Um, please join the E3 special interest group that is on the ASC homepage to receive further updates on our next E3 lecture. And also follow us on Twitter at E3 ASE. Thank you guys so much for, for joining in tonight. And does anyone on the panelists have any additional comments? Congratulations, E3. Um, this was a, a lot of people registered in short order for this webinar. So clearly it's a great forum. Um, look forward to more comments and, and I'm sure more folks will looking for this when it's available online. So thank you for the invitation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all for joining in. Thanks, Have a great night. Thank you.